Hi everyone, Zoe here, returning as promised with um, part two of my micro series on oh, how our governments routinely disregard democratic ideals and ignore the needs and express wishes of their citizens. You know, it's, it's funny, it's almost like our politicians don't work for us, but that can't be right, can it? Anyway, um, in part one on Monday, I provided some historical context for modern conceptions of democracy, and in particular, I showed how the revolutions of the late 1700s seemed to be auguring well for a resurgence of democratic ideals worldwide. Sadly, um, that trend has reversed itself in recent decades, and the extent to which our so-called democracies have been compromised has been exposed by a series of ever worsening uh, global economic disasters and more recently by inept governmental responses to COVID-19. So today I'm going to discuss some of the specific techniques our governments use to undermine democratic process and to prevent our votes from achieving significant positive change for the lives of the majority of the populace. Oh, and if you find this video interesting, please do like, subscribe, comment, and um, if possible, support what I do by one of these methods. As always, thanks in advance. Now, um, perhaps you've heard the sentiment expressed and erroneously attributed to everyone from Emma Goldman to Mark Twain that if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it. Now, sadly, there's more truth to this than we might um, be comfortable acknowledging. In 2014, researchers from Princeton and Northwestern published a paper that analyzed to what extent the preferences of the average person affected which laws were actually passed by the U.S. government. Turns out the answer is um, practically none. <laughs> In this figure, the black line shows the predicted responsiveness of legislation to the wishes of different subsets of the U.S. population. Now, in a perfectly democratic society, the graph would show a strong correlation between what the citizens want and which laws get passed. Simply put, we'd expect to see a diagonal line running you know, from the lower left to the upper right. Instead, we see an almost flat line, which tells us the US government doesn't really care um, what the vast majority of the citizens actually want. I mean, it doesn't matter whether a mere 10% of Americans favor a policy or an overwhelming 90% of them do, the chances of it being passed into law are basically the same, around 30%. Put another way, their votes don't matter. You know whose votes do matter though? The ultra rich, I know, right? Total shocker. Note how much more responsive the US government is to the interests of the obscenely wealthy. If the billionaires and the corporations and lobbyists they control don't want a law passed, it doesn't matter if hundreds of millions of Americans are clamoring for it, it's likely to be shelved or even buried. On the other hand, if the oligarchs who own and operate the government are especially keen on a policy, it has a very high chance of being adopted, even if hundreds of millions of Americans vote against it. There's nothing even remotely democratic about this. The study also found that the U.S. political system skews heavily towards maintaining the status quo. And even when a vast majority of the public actually favors change, they tend to not get it. And this isn't by accident. It's the result of specific decisions made by the architects of the U.S. Constitution based upon their overt mistrust of majority rule. I mean, like privileged rich dudes the world over, the Founding Fathers shared a paternalist belief that only the right sort of people should be permitted to rule, which is to say, them, or people sufficiently like them. And uh, two and a half centuries later, we see what their selfishness and lack of faith in humanity has wrought. Basically a stagnant political system that fights progressive change tooth and nail, whilst enabling a tiny ruling class to brutally exploit the populace for profit. Another recurring failure mode um, seen in our so-called democracies is the consolidation of power into what effectively become entrenched two-party political systems. Now these generate a lot of heat, but very little light. And in fact, this is precisely what we'd expect to find in any country that relies upon um, a first-past-the-post electoral system. Now, for those unfamiliar with the term, First past the post means the candidate with the most votes on the ballot automatically wins, even if they receive less than half of the total votes, whilst every other party who fielded a candidate receives zero representation in government, regardless of how many votes they actually won. So 
Obviously, most nations avoid first-past-the-post because it fails to accurately represent the will of the voters and over-represents larger political parties at the expense of smaller ones. For instance, um, in the 2015 UK general election, the Conservative Party received more than half of the available seats in Parliament, despite only winning about one-third of the actual popular vote, whilst parties like the Greens and UKIP only landed one seat each, despite earning a substantial fraction of the popular vote. In those countries that insist upon using it, um, like the US, the UK, Canada, India, First Past the Post invariably elicits a broad spectrum of toxic and undemocratic behaviors by political parties and voters alike. So um, let's look at some of these. First, we should really acknowledge the horrendous psychological impact of training people to view elections not as opportunities for all citizens to express their desires, hopes, and needs, but as an outright war between opposing camps where winner takes all and those on the losing side are deprived of political agency, no matter how worthy their cause or how valid their needs. It's basically a form of societal self-harm to frame every single election as a zero-sum game rather than as a chance to encourage diversity of opinion, to foster empathy for other groups and, you know, the problems they're facing, and to develop sorely needed life skills like, you know, genuine compromise or diplomacy. Instead, um, we're pressured as voters into the soul-destroying practice of tactical voting to avoid so-called wasted votes. To explain, um, in a first-past-the-post system, a vote for anyone other than the winning candidate achieves no representation whatsoever, so voters feel compelled to vote tactically for a candidate they feel has a better chance of winning instead of the candidate that they genuinely prefer. This is outright political self-censorship driven by a fear of being deemed complicit in the victory of the opposing team through the terrible crime of simply voting one's conscience. And this peer pressure to vote tactically is also cynically exploited by national party conventions, which guilt voters into casting their ballots for whatever awful candidate um, is considered most useful to the ruling class instead of the one the majority of the people actually wanted their party to endorse. This is a voting system which doesn't even try to hide its disdain for the will of the people. Another worrying consequence of First Past the Post is the prevalence of so-called safe seats in geographical areas where the major parties have concentrated their voting bases. Incumbent politicians in these voting districts have no real need to respond to the interests of their constituents because there's almost no chance of them being voted out of office. For instance, um, in the UK, the Electoral Reform Society estimates more than half of the political seats nationwide could be considered safe. Let me just say that again, more than half. So in more than half of the country, that very first link in the chain of fundamental representational democracy is broken. Unsurprisingly, there's also a clear correlation here with um, political corruption. For instance, the, um, the British MPs involved in the 2009 expenses scandal were disproportionately more likely to hold safe seats. And even when a public outcry against such scandals forces a specific politician to step down, another member of the same political party will simply take their place and carry on as before. And speaking of corruption, um, another unethical practice exacerbated by First Past the Post is um, gerrymandering. So this is where incumbent politicians redraw legislative boundaries to gain unfair advantage in the coming election cycle, either by altering the concentrations of voters favorable to one party or the other. It relies upon the dual strategies of packing and cracking, Packing um, is the creation of a handful of sacrificial voting districts so densely populated with voters favoring the opposition candidate that most votes cast there will be wasted surplus. This takes large numbers of voters out of circulation, preventing them from challenging the party's own candidates in more hotly contested districts. On the other hand, cracking is the deliberate rejigging of boundaries, often zigzagging back and forth across city, township, or even county lines to fragment opposition voters, scattering them across multiple districts so they cannot achieve a majority.
And sometimes um, both major parties will tacitly settle on a sweetheart arrangement, or basically they've mapped the districts so that they lock in safe seats for their respective candidates on a long-term basis. Again, not democracy. Gerrymandering basically undercuts the very foundation of representational democracy because instead of voters choosing their politicians, politicians can choose their voters. For instance, in the um, 2012 US congressional elections, in states where Republicans oversaw redistricting, they bagged 75% of the seats in the House of Representatives, despite only winning 53% of the popular vote. Similarly, in states where Democrats controlled the redistricting process, they grabbed 70% of the seats with only 56% of the vote. One of the key dangers gerrymandering presents is how it enables minority rule wherever it is practiced, because those in power can safely ignore what the majority of voters actually want. This is how Republican-controlled legislatures in states like Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio have recently pushed through anti-abortion laws against the wishes of the majority of their own citizens. However, lest I give you the impression that it's only first-past-the-post systems which are democratically suspect, let's explore some of the other fun ways uh, modern governments typically circumvent the will of the people. The most common technique is simply to make it harder for people to vote. I mean, for example, in places like the UK, the US, Canada, elections always occur during the work week, which forces people to take time off from work in order to exercise their right to vote. This systematically disadvantages the working class who can ill afford the loss of income in the first place, and who often face employers who are unwilling to make allowances to their work schedules to cover the necessary travel time often via multiple legs of public transportation to and from the nearest polling station. Oh, and about that nearest polling station, another common practice um, to disenfranchise voters is for those in power to deallocate funding and resources from areas where the majority of residents are likely to vote against them. This ensures uh, there are fewer polling stations available to those communities. I mean, sometimes only one per county often with inferior accessibility, staffing, services, and hours of operation. It's no coincidence that this predominantly denies votes to people of color, and in fact echoes earlier racist practices such as redlining municipal neighborhoods to prevent non-white citizens from accessing home and business loans. And all of this presupposes that you haven't been barred from voting entirely through felony disenfranchisement. Most notoriously in the US, but also to a lesser extent in the UK, Australia, and a few other places, anyone convicted of a so-called serious criminal offense is deprived of their right to vote. As America incarcerates a far greater percentage of its population than any other country on the planet, and has spent decades escalating minimum sentencing laws for a wide spectrum of offenses, Felony disenfranchisement is an easy way for the U.S. government to exclude millions of otherwise eligible and overwhelmingly black votes from the democratic process. Worse yet, whether their voting rights are restored even after they've served their sentences varies widely from one jurisdiction to the next. Now, most European states have ratified the European Convention on Human Rights, so they only pursue things like felony disenfranchisement in very exceptional circumstances, like high treason. By contrast, the UK routinely withholds suffrage from prisoners, and in fact has spent the past 15 years defying the 2005 ruling of the CHR, which found the practice was clearly in breach of human rights. Of course, you know, now that the Tories have pulled the UK out of the European Union, they'll feel emboldened to push through more and more legislation that ignores or violates internationally agreed upon protections and standards. Much like the United States, actually. <laughs> By the way, um, this is what people mean when they talk about American or British exceptionalism. It's a refusal to honor established global accords or to participate on a fair footing with other countries due to some arrogant belief in the innate superiority of one's own culture. Of course, another way governments undermine the democratic process is by preventing voters from directly electing their president, premier, prime minister, or what have you. In many nations, it's a relatively innocuous situation where 
the elected members of the National Assemblies get to decide who will occupy that top spot. For instance, Boris Johnson is the UK's current Prime Minister, despite the fact that the British electorate didn't vote for him. Instead, when the Conservative Party won the 2019 general election, Tory MPs got to choose to give Johnson the PM's chair. However, about a dozen countries, the largest being India and the US, rely upon a further layer of abstraction um, called the Electoral College. In essence, while citizens think they're voting for their candidate of choice, in reality, they're ceding their voting rights to a group of um, electors for each state or province who have, in theory, promised to cast their votes for whichever candidate the majority of the people wanted. However, they don't always honor that commitment, and in practice, this intermediated system has led to two of the last three U.S. presidents achieving the Oval Office despite having failed to win the popular vote by hundreds of thousands or even millions of votes. In America, this, again, reflects less than ideal decisions made by the founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution. While the origin of the Electoral College is complicated enough for its own video, suffice it to say, the initial allocation of electors to each state was skewed by the then widespread practice of slavery. Furthermore, a vile proposal called the um, Three-Fifths Compromise gave Southern states far more seats in the House of Representatives than their free population numbers could possibly warrant, resulting in rich white slaveholders occupying the U.S. presidency for 44 of its first 48 years. And even when slavery was finally abolished and black men granted equal suffrage under law, the American South embarked upon an ugly, century-long campaign of systemic voter intimidation and outright disenfranchisement, the legacy of which is plain for everyone to see in the present day. So, having explored some of the ways um, in which the electoral process and citizen representation are routinely compromised in nations which claim to be democracies, it's time to ask a darker question. Does voting even matter when our governments have been captured by billionaires and corporations? And this is coming from someone who's participated in literally every local and national election since I came of age. I've always believed it was my civic duty, that I owed it to those who fought for my right to vote, and that I had a responsibility to act on behalf of those who were even now being denied their opportunity to do so. For decades, I found myself frustrated, sometimes even angry, whenever friends or colleagues chose not to bother with a particular election, or if they refused to vote tactically to give our side a fighting chance in the polls. After all, if we didn't get more of our people in government, how could we ever change things for the better? But you know what? I was wrong. And before you all freak out, I'm not saying don't vote. Do whatever feels right for you, seriously, but vote your conscience. Don't let people coerce you into supporting a loathsome candidate or guilt you over the outcome of any election, because that's just classic blaming the victim. Truth is, we're all being played by a system that's rigged against us, and I do mean all of us, you know, regardless of where you happen to fall on the political spectrum. In any country with a two-party system, or those with a multi-party system where two large blocks tend to trade the balance of power back and forth, everyone in the ruling class has the same ultimate set of priorities. First, keep decrepit late-stage capitalism on emergency life support until it gasps its final cancerous breath. Second, quietly facilitate industry deregulation, privatization of public resources, assets, and services, and the development of techno-fascist control structures to keep the population in line. And third, oppose any substantive societal changes which might threaten the ability of corporations and billionaires to continue siphoning off global resources. That's the playbook. It's, it's called neoliberalism, and whether or not they approach it from the political left or the political right merely dictates what type of voters they'll try to capture and which empty promises they'll platform. By and large, politicians don't care about us. We're just a means to an end, and uh, that end being keeping themselves in political office. You may have noticed that they get paid very well to ignore the will of the people, not only receiving very high salaries compared to what professionals in other fields earn, but also voting themselves pay raises at nearly every opportunity. So 
all the bluster, debates, and posturing we're treated to during a typical election cycle is merely theater designed to keep us complacent, to fool us into believing our votes really matter, that our voices are actually being heard, that the people we elect to office represent our interests, that our government values its citizenry beyond the extent to which our labor can be exploited by industry. The moment we stop accepting the charade, the state's power over us begins to crumble. We suddenly realize that whichever party seizes power, our lives will continue to worsen. Our governments will continue to keep the majority of people in a state of perpetual precarity for the benefit of predatory corporate entities. Politicians will continue to pay lip service to our wishes as they tailor most legislation for the demands of lobbyists and special interest groups. And the mainstream media, owned by the same billionaires who've brought human civilization to the very brink of ruin, will continue to stoke the fires of tribalism in order to keep us all divided and at each other's throats. So hopefully, I've convinced you we can no longer afford to prop up the myth, the lie, that our societies are democratic. Our complacency only helps the ruling classes secure an ever-tightening stranglehold on every aspect of our lives. It's what they're counting on. We've seen the trajectory they've set the world on towards authoritarianism, towards societal fragmentation, towards widespread environmental destruction, towards basically the end of human civilization. These people aren't leaders. They're just vile opportunists who won't stop abusing us unless we make them. In the words of Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. Of course, the more societal privilege a person has, the more distant the horrors of our world appear, the more muted those cries for justice become. I imagine many people watching this may be thinking, oh, things aren't that bad, or Zoe, I'm not ready to join the revolution. <laughs> and if so, that's okay. Um, you can still take steps towards activism and positive social change. And in part three, on Friday, I'll cover some straightforward things everyone, even you non-anarchist types, can do to make our societies more democratic. Again, I'll schedule it um, as a live premiere for 6 p.m. UK time, so I can respond to comments as it airs. So, please join me for that. And until then, stay safe. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help. And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.